Hi, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our session, country session on Equatorial Guinea this afternoon. I'd like to introduce His Honorable, His Excellency, Gabriel Mbaga, Obiang Lima, Minister of Mines and Hydrocarbons of Equatorial Guinea for his opening remarks. Minister, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, His Excellency, Minister of the Republic of Congo. His Excellency, other ministers are still in the room. I can see all of you. Uh, directors, representative of oil and gas companies and energy companies, um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before everything, I want to, one more time, um, speak a little bit. The difference of this afternoon is that uh, for two days, I've been dedicating about defending the priorities of Africa. And this afternoon, I am doing what I'm being paid for by my country, Equatorial Guinea. So I'm going to be speaking exclusively about Equatorial Guinea. That one more time, it's the country that pay my salaries <laughs> and make sure that I can keep doing this, this job and representing them. So. I will say that um, in my speech of the opening session two days ago, I did uh, uh, present a question, and the question was, uh, why were we here in Cape Town? And one of the answers were, because we care about our people and because we care about our country. Clearly, the, the ministry that I do represent, the Ministry of Mines and Hydrocarbons, it is the regularity body in charge of creating uh, the policies for this key industry, for both oil, gas, and mining. Now, clearly, the objective of these policies are to attract, guarantee and attract foreign investment and also national investments and continue the development of both our country, our economy, and at the same time, uh, the development of our people. For some of you who are not familiar with the oil and gas history of Equatorial Guinea, you will know that Equatorial Guinea were made what is today thanks to independent companies, small, I call it small and independent companies, that we used to meet in forums like this. And this is another the reason why I usually like to come to Cape Town. I usually like to come to forums like this because we are able to discuss with people who have a very clear priorities and what they want to do and what they can do. And again, individuals like yourself and advisors and consultants like yourself were the ones who opened the door of the development that we have in Equatorial Guinea. But clearly, our industry and our production were led by big multinationals like ExxonMobil, like Marathon, like Amara de Hess. And clearly these multinationals regarding the sector of local content, uh, they did not allow, I would say they did some, but they did not allow, or the participation of local content were limited. And what Equatorial Guinea, and this again being the topic that we are discussing, what in Equatorial Guinea, in the ministry, we did as measures to be able to make sure that the local content were integrated through those those years was first we promulgated um, a local content regulation. And this local content regulation was uh, uh, presented by my ministry. And it was mainly to regulate some of the sectors that we do believe that local companies and individuals could do. Not just to create jobs, not just to have drivers, cooks, but to be able to have an indirect impact on our economy. I have to say that uh, it has its positive impact. Um, the other measures that we did was the construction of the Institute of Technology. I am uh, extremely happy of the results of this project because the only thing we did was to travel to Trinidad and Tobago, see what they did in the Institute of Technology, copy the same thing, 
and then through different institutions, including one that we have a representative here, Monica, from SAIT, we're able to increase the level in less than two decades of a lot of our workers in Equatorial Guinea. Now, I do say that the resource of local content in Equatorial Guinea were successful because we recently concluded under very low prices, under a pandemic, a 400 million project by Chevron, Noble Energy Chevron, to be able to connect a field, and this was the Alain field, to be able to bring gas all the way to Punta Europa. This was done on time. January of this year, we did actually have the first production. And what I'm extremely happy, I am extremely satisfied what both Marathon, Chevron now, Noble Energy did, is that we achieved that almost 80% of the work not only were done by national, but also the participation of companies who actually are established in Equatorial Guinea with national establishment. So we did achieve in a very short period, and just thanks to that project, during this period of pandemic, Equatorial Guinea were able to satisfy phase one of what we call Algas Mega Hub. Now, I did not, and I'm not going to speak of what we have done in the past, because everybody has there. I do want to say some word about what we are planning to do for the future. Now, COVID even on the negative part, and we say in Spanish, no hay mal que por bien no venga, meaning that every bad thing also rise a good thing. And through COVID, we discover how prepared Equatorial Guinea is, how their people in the oil industry has been trained, and also how prepared the operators are to be able to engage and do projects with us. Because I have to say one thing, a lot of those projects were done with limited transportation of expats. A lot of the projects were done with materials in country. So that really proved one, one thing that I did call the country managers of ExxonMobil, Marathon, and Noble when the full lockdown started. And again, the question was, can with our own infrastructure in country and with our human resources, can we continue operate during the, five, the four or five months of lockdown? And the answer of them that I was very surprised was, yes, Excellency, we have enough human resources from the country that actually we can continue the production. And ironically, during the, padding, during the COVID pandemic, Equatorial Guinea not only maintained the same production, we actually produced 20,000 barrels additional. So clearly it was an achievement for us. Of course, the oil price didn't help, so Minister of Finance were a little bit confused when I told them that actually we produce more, but uh, we generate less fund but because of the oil price. But for us, we were extremely happy because just with our personnel, we were able to actually not only maintain the production, but at the same time being able to, uh, in a way, um, increase production. So I say that I'm going to speak of what is coming next from Equatorial Guinea. We are considering that Equatorial Guinea has already gone through the phase, first phase of, of the oil and gas industry. And what's the first phase? The first phase is convincing investors that there is oil and gas and potential in Equatorial Guinea. First phase is to be able to do infrastructure, to have ports, airports, and human resources to be able to support that industry. First phase is to be able to have institutions like the Ministry of Mine, even the Ministry of Finance, even the government, even the Prime Minister and His Excellency the President, to understand how this industry is done. So one will ask, so what's phase two? Phase two is what I had been mentioning yesterday, and I will keep mentioning it, is taking destiny in our own hands. Now, what I mean about that is that 2022, it is going to be named the transformation year. Now, why is a transformation year? Our hydrocarbon law was actually, uh, is from 2006. 2006 on Equatorial Guinea, I was coming to Cape Town. We did not have an LNG plant. We didn't really know about gas. We didn't really care, knew that we could actually operate installations. And we didn't never knew that we could reach the level of production that we reach. So we are in 2021. There is many things that we have done that we do it because of the experience, but it's not in the law. 
So the first phase that we need to do is to be able to look back into the hydrocarbon law. Now, a lot of people and investors, consultants, companies, usually get very afraid when they say a government or a ministry is going to change the law. That's not going to be the case in Equatorial Guinea, and I want to make sure that you guys understand. It's actually going to be the opposite. That modification in the law is going to make sure that Equatorial Guinea is prepared to be able to actually bring more investors and have more clarity on our oil and gas industry. One of the key things is we're going to be clarifying about gas. Our transition of energy, really, is good. We will do panels, we'll do some solar, uh, we do all that that we do have to require. But our real transition is to change priority from oil to gas. If anybody evaluate what Equatorial Guinea have done, we have actually utilized and have more force working on gas than in oil. We transform gas for electricity, right now. We transform gas for methanol. We produce 3% of the methanol in the world. It used to be that in the 10 years ago, that we used to produce 14% of the US market methanol was coming from Equatorial Guinea. We just delivered our first methanol cargo from Equatorial Guinea to Gabon for the oil and gas in, um, timber industry. We also transform our gas to LNG. And clearly, gas already has been for a decade creating more jobs in Equatorial Guinea than oil. So clearly, the focus is going to be gas. The other reason of gas, and everybody has heard about the gas mega hub, they have heard our engagement with our neighbors, Cameroon and Nigeria, is because clearly for decades, gas has been flared in the Gulf of Guinea. And we do believe that we can find a solution not only to exploit and utilize our own gas, but also to find a solution definitely for them to be able to have a benefit from it. Now, a lot of people will say, you know, why Cameroon and Nigeria will do that? Because clearly LNG is the resource that can create value. Electricity, you can do it. You can do methanol. But if you really want the upstreamers to be able to bring your gas, you just tell them that that gas will be transformed by somebody else and give you e either in liquidity or either in LNG. And I can guarantee you everybody will be extremely happy about that. So that's really what we are putting in the table. The second thing that we are going to be clarifying in our hydrocarbon law is going to be local content. Because everybody goes to different places and have different definitions. We need to be very clear what's local content. What's local content in the position of the government, the ministry? What's local content in the position of the IOC, NOC, and the rest? So we're going to be engaging to have a very clear understanding what's local content. Rather than one individual come and say, no, local content is this. And then another one say, is this. So that's going to be very clear. So when an investor comes to the country, he say, in Equatorial Guinea, local content means this. So that's going to be something that jointly in the industry will do. And that has to be defined by everybody, not just by the minister. It has to be defined by the Minister of Commerce, by the IOC, by NOC. We need to engage in clearly. And I have to be very clear, local content in Nigeria or in Ghana can be different in local content in Equatorial Guinea. We are limited in population. So we are not going to talk local content is to everybody 100% be national working in the oil and gas, because I don't want that either. But maybe we could say that local content means that 20% of the budget that you're going to have in the plan of development need to go to indirect projects. So or local content could be that 10% of your budget need to go to the university or the institute to train people to do something else. So that had to be an engagement between both the ministry, the IOCs, the NOC, and again, the indirect benefit of the country. The other issue that we are going to be discussing in the new law is the fiscal incentive. Fin fiscal incentive does not mean that the government is going to give a free ride to the company not paying taxes. Fiscal incentive means that at the same time that the government are taking risk, the, country, the, com the company take risk. It is not fair that the oil price goes up, the company makes a lot of money, and the government also makes the same thing before. But at the same time, it's not fair when the price goes very down and the companies are having serious problems that also the government asks them to pay a lot of taxes. So it has to be a hybrid that 
At the same time, that helps the government, also it can help that. And there is many examples in many places that is done. And that definitely can help and also can make sure that the government also receive the right taxes that need to be done, especially in the windfall times. The other issue that is going to be talked is abandonment. I talk about the next phase. Now we're going into three of our main fields have been already mature. Some of them are talking about abandonment, and I want to talk about fading. So we need to be very clear what's abandonment, what uh, environmental protection we need to do to make sure that we don't leave contaminated. There. The other issue that is very clear with material fears, transfer of assets. An asset that has been amortized belongs to the government. So it needs to be very clear. If it is completely amortized, that means that your investment, you already have recovered, and that infrastructure, in a way, it belongs to us. So if you want to continue to use it, yes, you can use it, but you need to pay a fee for it. Because it needs to be maintained. We don't want you to just leave us an infrastructure that by the time you hand it, already yeah, collapse. So that needs to be clear. And there's many other examples can be done also in the law. The other issue that is very important, operation boosting. We need to make sure that we actually do what we discover in COVID, that we really can actually operate the entire infrastructure. The other issue that is very important that I want to announce here is that we are going to be transferring our strategic technical city from the city of London in the UK to Abu Dhabi, the Emirates. This is very important. This is not just because they are harassing me in London all the time, in Houston, you know, with protests with the rest, and in Abu Dhabi they don't do that. But it's mainly because you have to go where your people are. You have to go where people in your sector understand what you do. And right now in the Middle East, the ones who have created that infrastructure are the Emirates. And Abu Dhabi clearly had been able, and going next week to Adipak, our data room, our technical training is definitely going to be focusing in Abu Dhabi. So Abu Dhabi is going to be clearly our strategic partner regarding technical. The other reason is very simple. They already have gone through the, frame, the same phase that we need to do. So who are the better person to ask how to do it correctly? People who already have done it. The other issue that is very important that definitely we will discuss I already said, is gas. We will focus on gas. Gas creates more jobs than oil. Gas has more products that you can deliver. And clearly, the last part that it will be very important for phase two on this year of transformation is going to be linking the mining sector with the oil sector. This is very important, especially I have already mentioned it in our continent. We are one of the continent, excluding Australia, we call it continent and island, they have a lot of mining, and all that mining requires energy. It requires the resources. So it's very important to be able to link that resource of mining with oil because it creates value for the people who actually make the discovery. And definitely gas is needed for the boilers. It is needed for power. It is needed for transformation. So if you actually link, again, industries that export or process gold, and we can provide them gas. And this is what in the Middle East have done. This is why the majority of the aluminum smelting plant are successful and valuable in the Middle East, because they give the gas almost for zero. But clearly, it's because they link it already, the mining, with the gas. So with this, like I said, I'm here to talk about my country. I want to invite everybody to be able to invest in Equatorial Guinea. And I can guarantee you every single dollar and cents that you will invest, you will recover it, you will make more money, I will make more money, we all will make a lot of money, and we all will be very happy with that. I want to thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. You certainly did earn your money today. Um, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel. We have with us today Samuel Deminas, COO of Bay Matrix, John Hamilton, CEO of Panora Energy ASA United Kingdom, Monica M. Bennett, Senior International Client Development Manager, Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, Ian Cloak, CEO of Afentra, and Pablo Memba Ituba, Chief Executive Officer of Equatorial Resources. Welcome, all of you. Okay, so we're a bit tight on time. Um, I have questions, but feel free at any time to interject, or if you disagree, or add anything. I'm going to start with the minister, so I'm told to go hard at you, but <laughs> we've had a long day, so 
Um, what, you, you were speaking about attracting more investors. How are you changing the regulatory environment to make this possible? Well, uh, the, the answer is very simple. You reduce bureaucracy. Reducing bureaucracy, it's, it's something that is very important because it creates a lot of headache to the IOC, NOC, and locals. And, and that's something that we already have discovered. I mean, for example, uh, we have here the Secretary of State of, of Planning that is here. We have a lot of uh, engagement now with the Minister of Commerce, and, and that's why in the hydrocarbon law, we will invite them because we need to make things more simple. We have an IOC who have to bring equipment. At this, current, at this current moment, that's an individual need to talk with the Minister of Commerce, he need to present to the Minister of Finance, he need to present my own ministry, so the paperwork is greatly. Now, I can try to impose as a minister that we clarify, but it's not the law. So one of the things that we definitely are going to be doing is definitely reducing uh, the, the bureaucracy, that's one of them. The other one is to look into sectors that we are interested for investors to come. Uh, for example, um, I'm, a, well, I'm an oil and gas man, and I know that the more important thing that you need in oil is to drill. It doesn't matter what the geology, geophysia, the gurus, the witch doctor tell you about oil, is you have to drill. Drilling is the more important thing, so you need to look those mingle companies who are ready to take the wild cutters people who make Equatorial Guinea what it is, and those are the ones that you need to attract them. So you need to do legislation so that individual that maybe only have 40 million can come to Equatorial Guinea, give them all flexibility, make the discovery, and then we jointly discuss with the majors, negotiate to make money. So those are the things, reducing the, the bureaucracy, and secondly, doing the legislation to give fiscal incentives to those people that we really need, the drillers. Okay. And are these incentives imminent? Um, well, a lot of them are already there uh, in, the, in the law of investment. The problem is that in the law of investment is regulated by the Ministry of Finance. So what we need to do is we need to work with them to be able to present it because there's a lot of investment that a lot of people don't have time to read it. They focus on the hydrocarbon law. But in the law of investment that Equatorial Guinea have, it's a lot of incentive that is there. But we still need to increase it even more because... I have to remember that in uh, 2006, there was Congo, there was Equatorial Guinea, there was Nigeria, uh, Ghana was coming, Angola. But now in Africa, you have Senegal, South Sudan, Kenya, Mozambique. There's many places that those people can go. So if I start giving them a lot of headache, they will just pack their back and leave because there's other places that have that incentive. So, so yeah. those incentives are going to be important to keep them, but also to attract new ones. Thank you. Uh, so my next question is for John. What will the long-term impact of COVID-19 be on local content and capacity building in Equatorial Guinea? Can COVID serve as an opportunity for enhanced local content development? <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. Um, well, I'm not sure I can actually add much more than, than the, the minister has already said. I think that uh, maybe I'll try and do it maybe for more the perspective of the, of the oil operator here, which is that uh, I'm telling you things you already know, but uh, we, were, we were at the coalface, so to speak, last year, threatened with very, very low oil prices, but logistic challenges uh, in oil production, keeping things going, keeping production going, keeping crew changes going, the logistics of bringing things out, in and out of the country, bringing people in and out of the country, really, really challenged the sector and it challenged the host governments, it challenged everybody. And as the minister stated, it's amazing, but uh, production continued. In the case of Equatorial Guinea, it even increased. Uh, we're also up, uh, active in Gabon, in Tunisia. We experienced the same thing. And, and the question is, well, how, how was the industry able to do that uh, against what was probably one of the most challenging operational environments that any of us had faced? And I think it's two things. I think one of them is that the Oil and gas sector, for all the, the people that think we're pariahs, um, you know, have extremely good uh, management systems, HSE protocols. You know, we're effectively ready for these kind of things to happen. Maybe we didn't know exactly it was going to be this. But as an industry, we pulled together and managed to somehow, despite these adverse conditions, these extremely adverse conditions, particularly if you add the low oil price, to continue to produce, which is incredibly critically important for the host governments, critically important for 
all of the stakeholders of these businesses. So I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, and this is not true for every country, but Equatorial Guinea is, is a good example of it, is that the local content, um, the uh, local service providers, the employees, they rose to the challenge. And that's not something that you can just flick a light switch on that you suddenly create, saying we've got a problem, we we'll suddenly create a whole bunch of really good local people and local companies that can step into any breach that you know the international uh, logistics community cannot satisfy. That was something that is 20, 30 years in planning. That's, uh, in, the, in the case of Equatorial Guinea, of course, that's the framework and the ministerial orders in, in, in respect of local content and the framework for that. It's the Instituto you know, that was created. And we, we've also seen this in Tunisia. It was the same thing. If you uh, plan for this 20, 30 years in advance, uh, you, you're going to have at least a good chance of addressing these things. So uh, the, the minister used a Spanish phrase, I won't try and do it, but I do also <laughs> see a silver lining here. The pandemic is a terrible thing, but the silver lining here is that it's shown that actually it can work. The local content can step into a breach, can fill the holes that might have been left behind. It requires a lot of work. So I, I'm actually quite, I, I, think, I think there's a great future despite uh, everything that's happened for local companies, mm -hmm. local stakeholders to get more engaged in these projects. Great, thank you, John. What are the opportunities for public, yeah, can private... I, sorry, can I just add to John? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Thank you. It's, it's not necessarily specific to EG. It, um, it was my former company, Tullo, that, uh, when we were in, it, with, uh, with Garden, we had two FPSOs there. And just to sort of share a similar type of story there, I think when I came back from Cape Town, February, my last trip, 2020, and, and COVID was hitting March, uh, and we had an exec meeting, and we thought that we'd be shutting down the FPSO in six weeks because that was how long we were thinking that, well, we've got to have the, the routine of, of changeovers. Well, the FPSOs didn't get shut down. The, the, all of the employees, the Ghanaians, uh, kept it going and, and actually increased the production. Um, we were still drilling and, and the safety as well. So I th your last one about, I think the future is absolutely bright. You don't need lots of expats flying in. Uh, there's, there's plenty of really good talent on the continent. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so what are the opportunities for public-private collaboration to foster skills building and knowledge transfer? Monica, if you wouldn't Yes, mind. Um, you know, that's a very good question. And um, SAID, so we're a technical institution in Canada. We've had the honor to work with the Ministry of Mine and Hydrocarbons in Equatorial Guinea. And it's been a really good example about um, bringing private industry education, working together. Um, we've worked with the industry in Equatorial Guinea. We had meetings with them to try to understand what kind of gaps are required for the training. So it's critical to have industry. It's also critical to have the ministry involved uh, and the Minister of Education as well to pick the correct programs that you can provide in the country. And as His Excellency Mr. Lima mentioned, the Instituto Tecnológico in Mongomo is a perfect example of that. Um, SAID, uh, we had a team of subject matter experts come and look at the facility. It's a beautiful facility that could be used for lots of technical training. Um, so it definitely there's an opportunity there and I encourage, um, it's very critical to work with industry to have the support of everybody to create the programs. Um, and then also in the past, we've worked with the ministry. Um, they also sent trainees to Canada. So it's been a combination of both. Um, but I do encourage um, the approach Equatorial D Guinea has with their institute and building the institute. And what's important is having the equipment and the facility. So there's tons of opportunities for collaboration, for industry to donate equipment. Um, at the end of the day, you want to have an institution that provides the skills, the transfer of skills that are required from industry. Thanks, Monica. Uh, Samuel, next question is for you. What are the primary obstacles for local employees to obtain the relevant skills needed for highly technical positions? In um, the, the main challenge is that um, you encounter in Equatorial Guinea currently is that a lot of the manpower is not very, very highly skilled. When I say highly skilled, they are not at the top level, the highest level of the industry. Um, Equatorial Guinea has done something that is quite appreciative if you are recruiting, and I'm saying this having 
recruited about 300 people in the, in the recent project. Um, the island gas monetization project, of which we are one of the major uh, service providers to the client, Noble now Chevron. We have a lot of well-trained people in terms of academic training, people who have been to the different institutions. So many people from Equatorial Guinea have international degrees. Excellent. The problem is that in order for you to be able to build a high level of expertise today in the oil and gas industry, you need experience. You need to keep doing this job every day. It's not you go to a course in Canada for two weeks or one day, you come back and you sit at home, or you work on an eight-month project. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with Equatorial Guinea because in the past five years, the, the oil industry has been on a downturn. Um, so we hope and that as we move forward, um, there are opportunities to consistently have and train these people academically and in technical institutions, give them opportunities to build their expertise by working consistently. Now, I would say what we do as a company, which is we try to move people around even from Equatorial Guinea, because today it's a global pool. If we are looking for the best mechanical engineer for a project that needs to be done within the next two weeks, we are going to look for the best person anywhere in the world. In most cases, he's in Malaysia, Houston, wherever he is. Um, so a country like Equatorial Guinea that is just joining this queue doesn't have that level of expertise, but it's up to us to build that. So more opportunities, and that goes back to John, your, your companies like you, you uh, the, the, um, have to cooperate with um, the public and service providers um, to support the local capacity in terms of continuously providing opportunities for them to build their expertise. Thank you, Samuel. Can I just add to, to, yes, to what Samuel said briefly? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if any of you attended the, um, the talk yesterday by Clarence Seedorf, uh, but it was, it was great. And he was being asked a lot of questions about a similar topic. You know, how do you, how do you get every possible candidate that could be uh, there for the job, make sure that they're being evaluated for that top job? And in oil and gas, these, these senior technical roles, you really do need the right person. You have to search all over the world for them because the consequences of having the wrong person in a highly technical job in this dangerous industry are quite quite severe. So you need to make sure that you've got the right person, but you also need to make sure that you've got the widest um, selection of candidates. And we're, we're quite new in Equatorial Guinea, so I, I, won't, I won't comment on that because it's, it's not my position of expertise at the moment. But one example, we operate in Tunisia. We have 200 people. We have two expats. Now, how, how is that possible? Is because uh, over the 50 years that uh, Tunisia has been producing oil and gas, you've had Shell there, BG, OMV, ENI, Total. They have taken the time to train, to mentor uh, 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 Tunisians to the point where they've gone all through the technical universities and technical institutes like you have in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, they've worked for the big companies, and then they're able to take on roles, senior positions across the country. And you'll find most joint ventures in Tunisia the same way. You have very, very few expats in the country. But again, getting back to my point, you have to sow those seeds a long time ago to reap them now. And thankfully, Equatorial Guinea is, is, is also in that position. But, uh, but that's very important. Thank and you. I'll just uh, yes. build on John's actually there. Um, so I guess, make your excellency, I'm a witch doctor because I'm a geologist by background. Um, looking for oil, uh, and uh, um, one of the things that, 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 from a geologist or geophysicist perspective, the, the, most, the more basins you see, the more geology you see, the better you become. And that's what we try to do, a former company, is, is you, you try to uh, rotate people through and build up their exp experience. And then if you sort of then take it into maybe the more operational side, what we try to do um, so when we were drilling wells in Guyana uh, in 2019, my drilling engineers actually came from Ghana. They'd been trained up, uh, and you know, it was, it was an amazing adventure. They'd been drilling on Jubilee in 10, uh, and actually now they were drilling on a wildcat uh, in, the, in the deep water of Guyana. Uh, so again, we were trying to build their, their experience up, so then they would be leading the operations. And the same with what we call community liaison officers. Uh, in the field in Uganda. We would take them from Uganda to Kenya, from Kenya to uh, Zambia, to, to Cote d'Ivoire. 
again just building up their expertise and they then became they could leave the company if they wanted because they, they their skills had been built up and that was a that was a success so again as a witch doctor trying to find oil the more basins you see the more successful sometimes you can have. thank you Ian I can I can confirm that for more too long too long people are witch doctors <laughs> they find oil where nobody were expecting to find it so true fabulous but sorry, um, I'd just like to add, yes. um, I do think, based on my experience with uh, technical institutions, that Equatorial Guinea has taken an excellent approach by having their own institution um, and reaching out to international institutions that have the experience that can do the transfer knowledge. Because I've seen lots of countries sending um, individuals to Canada, the U.S., sending them abroad, but you also have to build the capacity. So I think they've made a great effort on that um, and very supportive. Great. Thank you, Monica. Um, Pablo, how would you assess the efficacy of Equatorial Guinea's current local content framework? I think it's perfect. <laughs> because... I love that answer. <laughs> Moving on. Because <laughs> Equatorial Resource is product of the Equatorial Guinean local law, uh, local content law. We created that company based on the opportunities and based on the law where the ministry and the government of Equatorial Guinea have established in Equatorial Guinea. And it gives opportunities also to small and mid-sized companies and people, even the ones where they do not have experience in the oil and gas sector. It's different for us because I had more than 30 years of experience, so it was easy for me to set it up. But for other companies, the law is there. We may lack something, which is the implementation, but the law is, helps all the local companies and also help companies where they want to come and invest in Equatorial Guinea. Because if you want to do business in a place we don't know, you always and it's best if you go and team up with somebody who is not the place. You can't go to a place just without knowing where you have to go. And if you team up with a company, local company in Equatorial Guinea, that will help you. And also that helps for trans uh, transfer of technology and knowledge. The law also helps that, uh, like um, the minister mentioned about the institute. That helped create the institute in Equatorial Guinea, and that gives incentives to companies where they do business in Equatorial Guinea. So as a product of that uh, local content law, that's why I start saying that it's great, and I believe it's one of the best laws, local content laws in, in the continent. Thank you, Pablo. And um, I'm not trying to just <laughs> do marketing about the law. <laughs> no, but it's because we take advantage of the law. And without the law, I don't think we, we could have what we have today. We already team up with companies, where they big companies, and okay, because of the confidentiality agreement, I want to mention the, the names of those companies. And that's thanks of the law. Thank you. Um, moving on, Ian, in your opinion, how have local companies been adapting to the global energy transition? Uh, no, thanks for this one. Um, so I, I guess the, the, I'll start it from maybe um, step, back, step back a bit. The, I think the conversations and the discussions that have been had over the last three days here uh, have been incredibly enlighten, enlightening. Um, I don't think we could have actually had those conversations up in uh, the UK because if we were having them, we probably would have actually been thrown off the stage. It, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a very different discussion sort of happening up there. And when I sort of come on to, I guess, the global energy transition, it's a journey. Um, it's going to take quite a while, and it's going to be at very different paces. Uh, Europe is, is, is going at, or wants to go at a very different rate, um, trying to run maybe before it can walk. And what we've seen up in the UK and Europe is, is gas prices shooting through the roof because somebody forgot to tell the wind turbines that the wind doesn't blow all the time and suddenly we, we had to get gas. And that impacts all, the, all the, uh, the, the local companies. So I sort of look at it in, from an Africa perspective that the local companies actually can, can learn from some of the mistakes being made elsewhere. 
but at the other side, Africa itself is, is incredibly innovative. And just a couple of, you know, you think about internet banking and PESA in Kenya. Well, that, that, was far, that came way ahead of internet banking uh, in the UK. Um, you look at geothermal in Kenya. That's been going for many, many years before it really became, it started being discussed in, in Europe. So, so Africa, actually, from a local company perspective and energy transition, actually is already innovating. Uh, and I think it can probably learn from some of the, uh, uh, the mistakes that, uh, that may happen elsewhere. Thank you. Thanks Joe, again. can I, can I yes. just add to that? Because I, I, think, I, I think Ian's touched on a, on a really interesting point. And I think um, one of the... Um, the consequences of the energy transition is that it's accelerating a trend that we've all seen for decades, which is large international oil companies, they divest assets at a certain time, and those, those are opportunities for other oil companies to step in, oil and gas companies to step in and take over from the larger international oil companies. But the energy transition is accelerating that trend that's been around forever, where you have the need for the larger companies to sell assets so they can um, uh, afford th their investments in the transition or perhaps they need to, to prove to their stakeholders that they're doing something about divesting from oil and gas themselves. So we have this, this situation where the larger uh, oil companies are divesting. We're seeing it in Nigeria now, Shell and Exxon selling, Tunisia we got ENI selling, yet Hess in, in, in Equatorial Guinea not too long ago. And that is a real, uh, that's a, kind of a, 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 a challenge, but it's also an incredible opportunity, I think, for local companies, and you know, again, to the topic of, of the panel, because what's happening is those companies are uh, being replaced by smaller companies that I like to think are gonna be a lot more flexible, creative, to use Ian's term as well, in terms of how, how do we go about running this business? We're not a multinational that's coming in with a playbook, uh, plug and play, this is how we run the operations, this is the way we're gonna do stuff. No, we need to take a step back and say, how, how can we do this differently? We're a smaller company. We have the opportunity to challenge what was done in the past. And embracing the sort of local content, uh, local companies, and how that works. So I actually think the energy transition, again, I know I'm getting one step away from the transition itself, but the consequence of the energy transition is that there are going to be, I believe, more opportunities for local content to really step up and step into the breach there. And I'll just uh, you, build, because it neatly tees up over the Africa energy transition, which is a Fentra, uh, our company. So, uh, and it's, we call it the industrial transition. It isn't something we should be scared of. Um, it, it's happened in the Gulf of Mexico. It's happened in the North Sea. And as the, the more agile independents come in, you can extend the lives of fields for many, many years. You know, the North Sea has been going through the, the, what the industrial transition say for 25 years. And it's still got another 25 years to go. So there, there's, and when we look at Africa and we look at the fields, we see opportunities where the North Sea was 25 years ago. Huge fields, huge stirrups, and then you can drive value for that, the, host com that the host governments, obviously the individual investors, but also the, uh, the, the, work, the employees in the country. Great, thank you, Ian. Uh, next question is for Samuel. How would you evaluate the strength of Equatorial Guinea's existing local and regional supply chains, especially recovering from COVID? Sincerely, COVID has um, had a very negative impact on um, countries like Equatorial Guinea because in the context of, in the realistic context, Equatorial Guinea is a small country. Um, how do we recover from that? How do we build after that is what I think we should focus a lot on. Um, regionally, there are a lot of discussions um, supply chains have to do with moving things from one place to the other, moving things regionally and internationally. On the regional scale, the impact has been very, very massive because to travel from Nigeria, for example, to Equatorial Guinea, which is usually a 30 minute flight, you may need to go to Europe or Ethiopia before coming back down. That's also related to traveling to South Africa and most of, most of the region. Um, it builds on us to be able to strengthen our investments, our capacity, the infrastructure that is needed to bridge these gaps. Um, there is also, on the policy level, the, 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 the Africa um, free trade 
um, agreement that has come into place. So I would say, going forward, we are looking more at um, a positive opportunity to strengthen those infrastructure that would support the supply chain system. Um, in the past, there has been a lot of disruptions, a lot of issues with, with that, and that makes us rely a lot on important things from maybe Europe, Asia, and the US. So I would, I would say more of let's look forward, and um, there are, from my experience and discussions being had, there's a lot more hope going forward than we had in the past. Thank you, Samuel. Yeah. Uh, my if, last question. If, oh, if sorry, you may I add, yes. I think about supply chain in Equatorial Guinea. We have more than six ports in Equatorial Guinea, and more than four international, uh, more than three international airports. So bringing goods in to Equatorial Guinea is not a problem. But because of COVID, maybe we did experience some uh, minor problems, and because of lockdown and all that. But that also helped for us to use the local employees where they used to work for those companies, or they work for those companies, to be able to take lead on the projects. Mm. So there's no, kind of, there's not that much issue about supply, mm. bringing products in or out, because we have two ports where they dedicated just for oil and gas, K5 and Port of Luba. And those two ports, they always been for receiving and shipping or whatever you want to do related with the oil and gas. On the port, in the airport, the airport from uh, the Malabo airport, before COVID, there were seven flights or two flights every, uh, every day. So there was no any problem. If you want to ship something from Houston, you can ship it with Iberia, Air France, or Lufthansa. So there was no problem, but because of the COVID, we, uh, we have been experiencing some, uh, some minor issues. Minor, thank you. Let me, let me add um, to the discussion. Yes. Uh, let me add to that. Um, he may be right, but again, there are some other challenges that we have to address head on, right? We executed a project where we had to shut down about 40,000 barrels of production, and we are under very immense pressure to deliver results within two months, three months. Um, pressure from everybody, from the minister, because he's not going to get paid when oil is not being produced. You have shareholders, you have the finance ministry, you have, and so on and so forth. So what's the point? I don't think there is any country that wasn't impacted strongly by COVID, and we need to learn the lessons there. Why? In Nigeria, for example, it's a very, very mature market. And this speaks on other topics that I hear the African minister speak more about. When well, we talk about supply chain, we don't communicate across the countries, the borders in the region. So if we wanted to get something into the country urgently, we would have to go to Houston to get it or go to China. <clears throat> and that thing is present in Portacot, which is 30 minutes from Malabo. The reason why this is, is because for you to get this from Portacot to Malabo, you have to go around back to Europe and take a very long detour. So what's the point? Um, it's up to you and I, maybe we buy a plane to fly from um, Port Harcourt to Malabo. Maybe we need to look at a lot more people making this kind of investment that strengthen the local supply chain. Locally, when I say sorry, when I say local, I was referring regionally. Locally within Malabo, you know, with all due respect to what you said, yes, of course, um, you can always deal with moving something from Bata to Malabo. The restrictions are not difficult to deal with, and you could get clearances or permits. The issue and the problem is, um, in a global world, sometimes what Saipem needs to deal with is in Congo, and they want to get it to Equatorial Guinea. Is there a route from Equatorial Guinea to Congo that is easily used? So that's the point I was trying to make. Thank you so much. May, may I say something on the part of the government? I, I, think, I think the way I have seen the impact of COVID, it's a little bit the same way that this virus works in, in, in the human body. COVID doesn't really, it's not COVID the virus, it's the, the, the impact that it has to some of the organs. So you have the COVID and then your lungs have problems, you have other bodies. So I think in the oil industry, what I have experienced as minister is the same. Why? Because 
It doesn't affect directly to operations. But I'll give you an example. A usually, in normal operations, you will have an expert two weeks, the platform coming, come out. You have a couple of engineers of the ministry, stay one week, come down. You have to move the foot. At this moment, there is not a movement. Some of them, they stay like two months, three months. They cannot move now. Before, that expert will stay two days in Malabo. They will go to a restaurant, they will go to a discotheque, and they eat some food, they buy some souvenirs, they can pick different airlines because you have airlines every day. But at this current moment, they can do that. So that discotheque is closed. They don't have these regular clients. The same thing happened with, with the ministry. You know, I used to have, have 100 or 200 engineers or technicians who go to the platform for different drillings. And right now you only have 20 that actually can. And you could imagine the rest of the 80 are having issue with their family because there is not that regularly going to the platform. So really what COVID have done, we can move. And, and the other issue about supply chain, what a lot of things done is that there is a lot of shared service. So when ExxonMobil Marathon has want to move something, they don't do it like before. They move immediately. They calculate and say, okay, um, next month there's a cargo coming from Exxon. They all pack together. So you could imagine it's only once a month that the cargo when it used to be every day. So I have to say that what I'm experiencing, the impact of COVID, of the indirect economy, is going to be very serious. And, and I don't know how we'll cover, recover for that, and it will take longer. Thank you, sir. All right, we're out of time, but I'd like to open the floor now uh, for questions from the audience to the panel. Uh, we can take about two questions. Fantastic. Please, may we keep it short and also responses as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All I need to say is to congratulate the Minister of Equatorial Guinea and the leadership for a very, very proactive decision they have taken. Uh, I think the issue of local content which they have done, if many other countries can learn one or two from them, I think this is um, the move in the right direction. And I think, secondly, this upskill, I mean, upskilling our people, training, uh, having more technical institutions, call it STEM, this is the way we should go. Let's capacitate our people to do that which they can within their local communities. And Minister, thank you very much. This was a very incisive uh, co contribution and discussion. Thank you. If I may, I want to just make some comment, but because it happens a lot. I mean, people congratulate Equatorial Guinea, and they say, Mr. Minister, you're doing a good job. I want to remind you how we did it. We were the last one in the Gulf of Guinea having oil and gas. So that really has been the advantage. So we saw what Nigeria, uh, Congo, Cameroon did, and then we use a hybrid because one need to be careful because I have that, you know, sometimes it looks like you are criticizing the other minister, criticizing the other country. Each one of the country have different priorities. So the local content of Nigeria is completely different than the priority of Equatorial Guinea because I have that, a lot of people, you know, Nigeria should do like Equatorial Guinea or Equatorial Guinea should do Nigeria. That's impossible. That's impossible because of priority. So again, I, I do appreciate that, but uh, what one needs to do is evaluate its own and make a call it because I keep saying a lot of things that people don't believe. One of the best countries that I like what they have done in local content is Nigeria. Even though people criticize Nigeria, this is the best example and there's a lot of things that people can learn from Nigeria, even the engineering, the rest. The only thing we have done and I have to say that right now, we just copy Nigeria, Cameroon, Congo, and then just, we did the hybrid from that. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much for your excellency. Um, we are open for one more question. All right, I'll come to you right now, sir. Hello. Yeah, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, sorry, uh, we couldn't come here on time because of logistic challenges. My name is Alendra Loishus. We are calling all the way from Malabo, Equatorial Guinea. I represent Nickel SL. We are a local company, 100% local. Of course, I'm a Nigerian at the same time, so whatever we're discussing here affects me directly, 100%. However, I want to say a big thank you to uh, the minister and the team. And uh, this is my the opportunity I have to meet them directly. Thank God for this opportunity. The organizers, well done. I'll give you guys a big applause. However, as regards to local content, to show evidence of how far Equatorial Guinea has gone so far, Nikolese represents that. 
Uh, as we speak, we have uh, inspectors that are into NDT that are local that have led experts in the field, in Exxon field. How, we were able to do that because of the fact that we looked at it and said, yes, COVID-19 gave us a two trajectory. One trajectory is the inability of us to bring in experts into the country to support our pressure. But the positive part is we're able to train our locals to become level one, level two uh, in NDT. You know how difficult that is to train locals without that background, but because of this situation, we're able to do that. And with the support of the uh, Equatorial Guinea government, which their laws are very stringent and very strong and sacrosanct, saying that is either you use the resources in Equatorial Guinea only when you can't find it in Equatorial Guinea that you can look out. And that has encouraged us to do more. So thank you and God bless you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our very esteemed panel today for sharing their thoughts and insights with us.